as the IRA continued their war of independence, the British government reacted by militarising the police. The Black and Tans uh, were uh, first introduced and then the Auxiliaries. The Auxiliary Division of the RIC, commonly known as the Auxies, were largely recruited from demobilised British Army officers and paid £1 a day. In August 1920, Brigadier General Frank Crozier was appointed commanding officer of the Auxiliary Division. Poorly trained and poorly led, they soon gained a reputation for drunkenness and brutality. In January 1921, N Company of the Auxiliary Force came into being in Dublin. On the 1st of February, a company of 30 auxiliaries arrived into Trim and occupied the industrial school. The regular police occupied uh, another place, premises in the town. Uh, Mead was one of the few places in the northern half of the country which had auxiliaries, which just goes to prove uh, how fearful the British authorities were of the IRA in Mead. The orphans from the industrial school were moved to the workhouse. At the top of the central block, the auxiliaries placed a machine gun and searchlight. According to uh, one local newspaper report, there were as many as 400 auxiliaries in the industrial school. Local volunteer Paddy Lawler estimated that there were 100. About 40 of the auxiliaries from Trim took part in a raid on a public house stroke grocers at Robinstown Balbrodig on the night of 9th of February 1921. The property was owned by Richard Chandler, a Protestant and probably a Unionist. The auxiliaries said they were searching for IRA ammunition. The auxiliaries ransacked the store and began stealing from both the store and the living quarters above. According to Mrs Chandler, the auxiliaries stole brandy, bacon, sugar, money, jewellery, bedclothes and household items. Mrs Chandler said they all seemed to be officers. They were running up and down the stairs and you would imagine they were mad. They had 11 lorries into which they threw the bedclothes through the window. The ordinary police and uh, army uh, stood back and did not take part in this ransacking. The auxiliaries left, but about 30 of them returned. They went from room to room looting. Then they went to the public house and took all the drink, whiskey, rum, port wine, stout, ale, 33 bottles of brandy, champagne and 200 pounds of sugar. They swept everything into the lorries and they again mistreated Mrs Chandler. Mrs. Chandler. The Chandlers uh, claimed damages of uh, 325 uh, pounds and they put this claim to the court uh, in Trim uh, a few months later and uh, here is a couple of very poor photographs from the newspapers of the time of Chandler's and this then is Mr Richard Chandler, Mrs Chandler, Miss Parsons and Mr Parsons outside Trim Courthouse. Again, sorry for the poor quality, that's the standard in the newspapers at the time. Five members of the raiding party came forward and reported the incident to their commanding officer Crozier. Crozier came to Trim and interrogated a number of auxiliaries on Sunday the 13th of February. The following day, 26 men were taken to Beggar's Bush and tried by General Crozier and dismissed from the force as unsuitable for the police. These officers went to London and visited the Irish office. General Tudor, the commander of all the forces in Ireland, was in London at the time. And he reinstated the 25 dismissed men because it was politically inadvisable to dismiss them. And he was still uh, he, he was st uh, still unsatisfied by their treatment by Crozier. On February 19, Crozier resigned his post, giving his reason. I still consider that theft on part of policemen in the course of their duties is unpardonable. And I cannot honestly associate myself with a force in which such acts are condoned. The atrocity of the uh, attack on uh, unionist uh, home, home and family, it became known as the looting of Trim 
and it made international news, including the New York Times. It was discussed even on the floor of the House of the Commons, and atrocities like this eventually forced a truce in the middle of the year. The auxiliaries uh, left Trem uh, in, uh, in April, and as they marched to the street, Trem streets, they passed my house here on uh, Kells Road or Railway Road, out to the uh, railway station, they sang, You'll Remember Me. Dan Daly has a wonderful article in last week's Chronicle, so you might look that up. And Jim O'Leary has an excellent book available in uh, many local shops um, uh, for, for sale. The father of comedian Dave Allen served in In Company of the Auxiliaries. There is no evidence he was involved in the Robinstown raid. His name was Colin Pussy O'Mahony and he became general manager of the Irish Times. And Dave Allen told a story about him to Michael Parkinson uh, in an interview back in the 70s. And here's a little bit of that story. I want you to repeat now, because it comes back to this thing about humour and fear, about your father that, that, that he told you about the IRA, which I think is a splendid example of this, this sort of humour coming out of tension and, 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 and strange situations. Well, Tell that story. It's, it's, it's not actually uh, a gag. It, it's not even humour coming out of tension. It's, it's, it's people taking fear beyond, or oh, not fear, but fright, personal fright. Mm. Uh, because my father was, uh, like a great number of Irishmen, uh, had been in the British Army in the First World War. And while they were away fighting in various places, it was a rebellion. And uh, then the war finished, and then came 1922, and Ireland, or Southern Ireland, was given independence. And my father came back to work on a, on a newspaper called the Irish Times. And he had been, he'd been threatened many times by the, by the IRA of that period. And uh, we as children were kind of brought up not to talk to strange men, not for various other reasons, but it might apply to my father, not to say that he left home at nine and he arrived back at eight or whatever. And he and a very famous editor called Smiley and a Irish columnist yeah. called Miles Nagopoulin They'd put the paper to bed one night, which is about four, and decided they'd go for a drink. So they drove up and got a cab and drove up into the Dublin mountains. And they were having a drink. And uh, my father noticed this man coming into the pub, very quiet, stood in the corner, got his little glass of stout, and occasionally looked in their direction. And my father said to Smiley, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that fellow's face before. Do you think it might be one of the boys, as they call them out? And Smiley said, well, just let's kind of move out and get the car and go off to another pub, which they did. And two minutes later, the man comes in again, orders his little drink, stands in the corner and watches him. And my father said to Smiley, um, what do you think I should do? I mean, Shall I go have it out with them and sort it all out? And Smiley said, no, don't be a nut. I mean, if uh, you don't argue with a gun, so let's just get to the guard, get into the cab, and off they go to another pub. And sure enough, in he comes. And by now, my father has got to the point of no return. So as the fellow orders his drink, my father goes out, grabs him, and hits him. And the man falls down, and my father's not just happy hitting him, he sits on him, and he's got his hair and his head together. <laughs> and he's banging this man's head on the ground. Sheer kind of rage. And he said, why are you following us? And the fellow says, I'm your bloody cab driver. <laughs>